Yeah, are we ready to go? Tara, you are muted. Um, I think I'm planning to kick it off. Is Kyra muted? I'm sorry. Uh, my cursor, here we go. This should share now. And we'll Looks play good. that. Okay. Well, uh, I'm thank you, Kyra. We, looks like we got the tech worked out. Um, I'm Jane Houlihan. I direct research um, at Healthy Babies, Bright Futures, and I, I'm just kicking this off to to give everyone an overview of some of the things we've found in our research over the past six or so years on heavy metals in baby food, um, and our work with FDA, other nonprofits, and WIC programs on solutions, things that can be done to reduce. Um, babies' exposures to heavy metals in baby food. So um, next slide, please. First of all, we've found, and FDA's own research confirms, that nearly all foods that babies eat are contaminated with heavy metals. So for instance, um, a study we conducted a couple of years back, 168 baby foods. Um, we tested um, a wide variety of foods, everything from cereal to sweet potatoes to snacks. We found heavy metals in 95% of the foods that we tested, one or more heavy metals, um, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Next slide, please. Another important point is that most of the baby foods that have been tested contain multiple heavy metals. So it's not just one at a time. Babies are exposed to many different heavy metals in the course of a day. And so those exposures are additive and the, the risks in some cases are also additive. Um, our study showed that one in four baby foods contained all four of the heavy metals that we analyzed, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. And you can see down the line, many foods contained four metals, three, two metals. So it's um, the exposures are quite complex and quite ubiquitous for babies when it comes to heavy metals in food. Next slide. We've also found that it's not just commercial baby food, which we've seen um, as a misconception in some of the media that um, have covered the story. Um, homemade baby foods and organic foods, for instance, are also a problem. Our, a study we released last year, in fact, we conducted head-to-head -head testing of the commercial baby food brands against homemade purees and what we called family brands, you know, uh, packaged foods purchased outside the baby food aisle. And we really found that um, we didn't see a difference in the levels and ubiquity of contamination. We found heavy metals in 94% of the commercial baby foods we tested, and also in 94% of those um, homemade purees and, and family brands purchased outside the baby food aisle. So this is a, a problem that just spans all different categories of food, all different types of food. It's not restricted to commercial baby food, certainly. Next slide. So the concern, many of you know, um, the health risks associated with these heavy metals include lifelong deficits in, in intelligence, and also just an array of social and behavioral problems. And there's no known safe level of exposure, particularly for lead. And so while these exposures do raise concerns, um, the, the area where we work on the spectrum from worry to action is really on the side of action because there's so many things that parents and companies and government um, agencies can do. Um, you know, no amount of heavy metals is considered safe and certainly less is better. So we're really working on that spectrum of um, iteratively helping to reduce babies' exposures um, closer and closer to zero. So next slide. When you're thinking about solutions, of course, it's important to understand the source of contamination. So heavy metals are naturally occurring in soil and water, but they're also found at elevated levels in particular fields where there's been past use of pesticides or contaminated fertilizer 
airborne contaminants and dust in industrial operations. So the crops are taking these metals up naturally. Um, some crops take up more than others. Leafy greens and root crops tend to have higher levels. And um, also how the food is processed may also affect the levels, but there's not a lot of data there. And right now it seems the um, the dominant source really is that um, contamination that's in the environment, either naturally occurring or concentrated from those pollution sources that we named. It's really widespread. So next slide, please. Also, when you're thinking about what are the solutions to this problem, it's important to understand which foods are contributing most um, when it comes to babies' exposures. So for arsenic, rice cereal is infants' number one source of arsenic exposure. Rice is also a really important source, and apple juice. Other foods um, are also a source, water and formula in some cases. Um, wooden play sets that for many years contained um, arsenic uh, pesticides um, can also be a significant source when children are playing on those. But really what pops out on this graph, of course, is infant rice cereal. Um, and there's something uh, that's something we can do do something about. Next slide. And then when we think about lead, I don't know if you can go back, Kyra. Um, the slide we just missed. I know Kyra was having having trouble going going back a slide. The slide we just missed on lead shows that um, lead is coming from a wide variety of foods. Some of the foods with the highest levels are sweet potatoes and um, teething crackers and cookies. But really, when you look at the whole spectrum of children's exposures, homemade baby foods and those store-bought brands that are not commercial baby foods, those are accounting for over half of children's exposures to lead. And those that slice of um, lead exposure from commercial baby foods is, um, a, you know, a fairly small slice of the pie. I actually don't have it memorized, but it may be in the order of, you know, 20 to 30%. So infant formula is also another really important um, source of lead exposure. So um, all those things can inform solutions. And we have solutions in play in this country at a lot of different levels, the federal level, state WIC programs, parents, there's so many things parents can do. And it, you know, among growers and suppliers and manufacturers that are that are making our food. So next slide, please. FDA a couple of years back launched their Closer to Zero initiative, where they really are for the first time um, setting standards for heavy metals in baby food. The initiative intends to help continually reduce toxic elements to the lowest levels possible in foods eaten by babies and young children. So that's a goal I think all of us can get behind. But over the past few years, we've really seen that very little progress has been made. And in fact, FDA just a few months back released their um, proposed standards for lead in baby food, their action levels. And when we analyzed <laughs> the impact that those standards would have on children's exposures, we found that lead exposure would be reduced for babies by only 3.6%. So that's the reduction we'd see if all companies complied with FDA's proposed standards. One problem is that FDA is only proposing to address commercial baby food at this stage. And you can see, oh, there's the number. It's not even 20% of babies' total exposure in that pie chart. Um, and you know, what we find is that until FDA is willing to address larger sources of exposure like infant formula or other store-bought foods um, like fresh produce that are that's used to make homemade baby food, until they address those other sources of exposure, they're really not going to be able to get very close to zero at all when it comes to babies' exposures to lead. So what this tells us is, um, you know, FDA moves slowly. They're, um, they so far haven't, haven't proposed things that would have a really big impact for babies. So it just puts more of the huh, pressure for change on, on other parts of that solution spectrum. So with parents or with WIC programs or with growers, suppliers, manufacturers themselves. So let's look at some of those solutions. Next slide. We, this is a very promising area, state WIC programs. Um, 
For instance, infant rice cereal has been removed from WIC food lists in Oregon, Alaska, and Hawaii. And that's a really big step because we saw earlier that infant rice cereal is infants' number one source of arsenic exposure. And that still leaves parents and families with plenty of options. Oatmeal and multigrain cereals have far less arsenic. They're available at the same price in many cases when we sampled um, prices at grocery stores um, that we have access to. Next slide. And just more about arsenic and infant rice cereal to show you the impact when state WIC programs take action. Um, our tests found six times more arsenic in infant rice cereal than in those other types of infant cereals. And of course, you know, babies aren't just eating infant cereal. There are plenty of other healthy options that aren't, you know, aren't cereal at all. So um, what uh, Oregon found in particular was that there was no problem with supply of other kinds of cereal when they made this change. Um, and they, they really had no um, concerns that were expressed by, you know, parents, manufacturers, baby food companies. So it really went smoothly when they made this change. And it was a great change for babies that reduced their arsenic exposures. So that's a super promising area that we're excited about. Next slide. One really big emphasis in our work at Healthy Babies Bright Futures is just to give parents at this stage information to make safer choices. So we've developed some easy to use fact sheets um, about you know, simple steps parents can take, uh, even a, a little menu, green, yellow, and red foods um, that we have available online and we can provide those URLs. And we hope that those fact sheets are you know, useful to some of you. Um, just one example of a resource that we provided was just, okay, here are five simple changes you can make to reduce exposures in, for snacks, teething foods, cereal, drinks, and fruits and veggies. And you can see when we looked at the, all the available data, if parents make these changes, you know, exposures can be reduced from one food to the next by, you know, up to 93%, um, you know, anywhere from 68 up to 93% reduction in exposure from those toxic heavy metals. So a lot that parents can do to have a, a pretty big impact. Next slide, please. And then there are just so many upstream solutions. You know, growers can follow accepted best practices, just modifying soil pH, choosing different crop varieties. Um, suppliers and food manufacturers can test. You know, they're not required to test for heavy metals, but it's certainly a really common sense step at this point that reveal what levels are um, for the you know, growers, for the ingredients that are coming in. And um, it, that would really help both suppliers and, um, and food manufacturers choose um, sources of ingredients that have lower levels. And also companies can invest in research um, to identify and evaluate methods to reduce heavy metals in products and ingredients, just basic research on, okay, what some of this is known. There's a lot still that's not known. Are there particular varieties of crops that uptake less heavy metals? You know, are there certain areas of the country, certain growing methods that that will really help? So some of that's known, um, but there's still a lot of basic research that can be done that can help on the upstream side. So all along the spectrum, there's so many solutions already in play um, and so many solutions that are promising um, that we can develop for the future. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a lot more information on our website, simple to use fact sheets um, that you know, de uh, designed for parents to help them make better choices. And we're also just happy to you know, give more information on this webinar. We'll give you some of the links to our resources as well. But um, we're extreme, really happy to be speaking to this audience in particular, because I know a lot of you are you know, working in the public health arena and um, you know, have the ability to develop programs and, and touch parents' lives in ways that can make a big difference for their children. So we're happy to be here and, and uh, help in whatever way we can. And I think Kyra, are you um, you you going to give us some information next on Bright Cities? I would be happy to follow. But shall we invite Charlotte if you wanted to add anything um, or share more about our organization generally before I go into Bright Cities? Well, just let me um, answer one of the questions that was posted that is spot on. That 
for both crops and for people, including babies. Um, the science is fairly strong that if they have enough good metals like calcium, they absorb less of the dangerous metals like lead. And so um, one of the other things that can make a difference uh, in crops is to do the soil amendments that Jane talked about um, and in people to make sure both during pregnancy and uh, in uh, a baby's early life that they have uh, a, a enough um, of, of the good metals, uh, calcium and magnesium in their, in their uh, diets to forestall the impacts of, of lead and arsenic and the other dangerous metals. And then there was also a question about can everyone on this call get a copy of the slides? And I give that question to you, Jane. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I don't know what the best method is for that, but. <laughs> I will send them out since I have a copy of them. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I will take it from there. Uh, just give me a second, please, to share my screen successfully. Let's see. Ira, while you're doing that, there was another question that we could toss out. Um, how are growers being educated and encouraged to take action? At this stage, I don't, I don't know of a federal initiative specifically to educate growers, but um, they, there's certainly a lot of information that USDA and FDA are making available publicly on the status of the research. Um, and I, uh, you know, would certainly hope that there's been enough attention to this issue that, that they're paying attention. Um, we've pushed FDA to, you know, issue best practices for growers. They wrote a fabulous article on best practices for cadmium, but it's in the peer reviewed literature. So it's hard to say how, how many growers are, are reading the journals. You can go ahead, I'll just cue this up. Charlotte, you're muted if you're speaking. Oh, I'm sorry, I clicked, but I didn't click hard enough. Thank you. And um, there's some really good research about certain varieties of carrots and certain varieties of squash um, that, that don't pick up the same level of heavy metals as other varietals. So it it there's enough early research to suggest that if we really paid attention, we could um, find the, the, the kinds of growing practices like what we can do with rice and what we can do uh, with sweet potatoes to um, uh, convince those crops to leave the heavy metals in the soil and not pull them up. Oh, and one last point is just, it's furthest, this research is furthest along for rice. And that's an area where we know that um, at least 16% of growers in Arkansas have converted their acres to the growing methods that reduce arsenic in rice, which is really good news. So rice, the rice industry is certainly paying attention. Great. Well, we look forward to continued discussion. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyra. I again want to say thank you so much to Denise and Nishka for having us today um, for the webinar. Um, Healthy Bravies Bright Futures, just for you, those of you that don't know, came together in around 2016 as a coalition of health practitioners and um, medical scientists, academics, and funders to um, convene around the topic of how to measurably reduce neurotoxic exposures. Um, and so thus was the, the birth of Healthy Babies Bright Futures, and we really have three main strategies to reduce these neurotoxic exposures. So Jane and Charlotte were at the were there at the inception of Healthy Babies Bright Futures and I joined about four years ago. Um, and so one of our pillars is research as Jane just so eloquently shared. Um, our second strategic pillar is communication. And we really try to lift up the work of all of our partners to just shine more light on this issue um, because one of our goals is trying to um, have talking about the importance of reducing uh, neurotoxic ex exposures just as a normal day-to-day -day conversation, as common as talking about planting trees. 
Um, and then our third strategic initiative is this Bright Cities program, and I'm going to share about that as we go forward. But while I'm doing that, I invite you, because we are not super familiar with the City Match audience, to just introduce yourself in the chat and maybe share what sector um, you work in and maybe how this work that we're sharing is relevant to your day to day. Because our goal is really to build connections here and to make this information useful to you. So how can you share this information with parents about reducing neurotoxic exposures and, and how can we help support efforts at the WIC level to, you know, have healthier baby foods on that list and how can we work most effectively uh, with our cities? Uh, oh dear. Okay. So now as I get started, I just wanted to give you kind of the lay of the land. I want to talk about Bright Cities. Uh, I want to share what, uh, through reflection and interviews with funders, you know, has risen to the top for us in terms of successful projects. I want to share our strategies that we're using to addressing the disparities that we see and also ask for your feedback and if you have practices that we could integrate. And most of all, share how to get involved. Um, as I said, that's really our goal for today. Okay, so the Bright Cities program um, really seeks to make brighter cities for all kids. And through that, we want to provide support for tailored programs that make the most sense in a city to reduce neurotoxic exposures. Through the presentation, I've included a lot of photos, um, and that's really what energizes me in my day to day. You know, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed by the magnitude of these problems, but it really is inspiring to just talk with people working in the community um, and at the city level and hear their passion and, and that energizes me in this work. Um, and so in my four years in this role, I have most commonly found that I typically partner with a city's climate resilience or sustainability officer. I would love to make connections as well with a city health person, but as you well know, most cities don't have their own health department and then there's always I guess I should say challenges, right? Working across the county health department with the cities. And so that's, I think, where I found my sweet spot is working with the climate sustainability or resilience officer. And what the other thing that I found, as I'm sure you well know, is that city staff are so busy. They're really great at multitasking. And I certainly don't want to be the person to ask them to do one more thing. And so what I want to do is share win-win strategies where whatever action we can take to reduce neurotoxics helps them achieve other goals in their cities, like reducing uh, carbon emissions if we're reducing air toxics because we know that has adverse uh, impacts for neuro neurodevelopment. Uh, so right now we have 40 U.S. cities within our program all across the U.S., ranging from communities of around 10,000. I think our largest bright city is Phoenix. It has a population of around 1.7 million. Um, we typically provide a seed funding, uh, grants as small as $5,000 up to $35,000. And in the last year or two, we really tried to be strategic about trying to uh, leverage the amount of these funds to procure matching funds from the city. And into this year, really working with interested cities to help support applications for the federal funding uh, that's available. So now you're wondering well, what what kind of things do you do? Um, when this program started, Jane did an analysis of all the opportunities um, across cities to reduce neurotoxic exposures. And as we've put um, that research into practice, oftentimes the actions can be binned into about five categories. So we have multiple cities that are working on increasing healthy food access. And we love this because it's a clear link between the awesome work, you know, that Jane has done and how to share the information out with parents uh, just about eating a variety of foods, uh, you know, to help protect our baby's brains. So I've put a couple cities here um, that are doing incredible work. In fact, the the picture there in your top right, I'm just checking it out for a minute, is from San Rafael, California. And they had a production farm and funding, um, in this case, both from Bright Cities, and we partnered with another organization called the Mayor's Innovation Project, which is um, a small working group of progressive mayors uh, to support their production farm. And with this money, they were able to 
um, according to their reports, provide enough food for 550 kids uh, through their summer program, organic produce from their garden, along with an education component that went along with that um, for the parents. Um, we really love to partner with affordable housing neighborhoods. Um, often they have a little more jurisdiction over the home environment than cities do. And so we have two examples, uh, one in Boulder, where I am based, um, and we work are working to transition three of the 54 affordable housing properties, I should say 54 affordable housing neighborhoods in Boulder to chemical free turf maintenance with an idea then to scale that work to, to all of the, the neighborhoods. So that involved, you know, starting with soil testing and building up soil health to reduce any kind of chemical or pesticide input needed to maintain healthy native species as well as healthy turf. Um, and we also worked using a different model in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the neighborhood was called the Hacienda CDC, and they drew from residents in the affordable housing community to develop a program to share information about, you know, non-toxic household cleaners or using a doormat, dusting more, taking your shoes off the door, and sharing parent fact sheets about what foods um, we recommend, you know, for babies. So really just trying to put pragmatic strategies uh, in place. We also have a host of cities working on cleaner air, air, and again, that provides co-benefits for climate and sustainability. So these typically look like tree planting programs, oftentimes in conjunction with um, youth partnership. Tempe, we actually partnered with the university there um, to use the academic for trees and hedges called vegetative barriers and measure the amount that these plants diminish air toxics when you planted them like between the busy roadway and a schoolyard or, or childcare facility. Um, lead, as you well know, is still a big issue. Um, we had a special series of webinars last year for, in fact, about all aspects of, re of replacing lead service lines, coming from worker health and safety to um, city programs that were models, such as new work, uh, problems that other utilities faced, like in Cleveland and Denver, so that we could, um, you know, help scale uh, our learning. Um, so those are a couple of the cities that we've worked in related to lead. Grand Rapids is especially interesting too, because in addition to working with the lead service line replacement, a couple cities, Grand Rapids included, are amending their rental licensing programs to include lead abatement. The Grand Rapids project is still in its initial stages, but they really had to go through a lot of review of laws, federal and state statutes to make sure that their policies, you know, kind of fell in line. So more information will be forthcoming about that. Actually, next month, we're going to be publishing a blog. Um, and then it is, I think, most challenging to really integrate these reductions into sustainable city plannings, but we have a couple cities that are kind of at the cutting edge of that. Holland, Michigan is part of the Great Lakes Climate Action Network, and they're actually leading a project with uh, maybe 15 cities looking at sustainable procurement. So that's putting in place policies at the city level to say, you know, we should purchase less toxics and in some cases, um, less carbon or less emissions, you know, products according to third party specifications um, that allow us to both reduce toxics and meet other um, other climate and sustainability goals. Similarly, Providence is working to incorporate um, some of their learning, which in their case was around pesticide free yards into their climate justice plan with the overall intention of then translating what's in their climate justice plan into their city's comprehensive plan. And that's really our gold standard because those um, general plans have legal teeth, right, so that we can preserve these uh, actions sustainably. Okay, now you can take a breather and check out some beautiful pictures from around the country. Um, up on the left-hand side, those are um, PVD is Providence, Rhode Island, and the 100 Resilient Yards is from South Portland, Maine both reducing chemicals and um, South Portland, you know, taking that actually one step further to help residents and give them some practical guidance about transitioning their yard away from chemical turf to either pollinator habitat or rain gardens. They had five different models um, that citizens could choose from. Uh, the adorable kid in the middle is from Salem, Massachusetts. 
um, their mayor gave permission to use an underutilized baseball field to turn into an organic community farm. And they also had a transit service that would take produce to families in need. And I think just last fall, they planted a community food forest around the perimeter of the garden with the hope that someday residents could freely walk and pick apples or nuts from that food forest. Uh, the cold looking picture is from Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, they're also doing a cool kind of novel approach that I just saw yet last year is where they have an energy efficiency program for their buildings, but they're also bundling lead and mold abatement as part of that energy efficiency assessment in hopes of doing kind of like a one stop shop for landlords. If you have to go through your energy efficiency programming, you can also look at lead and mold. Um, Madison, Wisconsin is doing something similar. And then the three pictures on the bottom are reflective of food work. Uh, the one on, let's see, my right is from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Columbia, South Carolina is right at the bottom. And then um, the final one at the bottom on the left-hand side is from Salt Lake City. That's Mayor Aaron Mendenhall with a group of food equity advisors. So our grant funding there supported a project um, of helping to cover stipends for residents from three areas that were identified as food deserts and the residents themselves then proposed um, appropriate solutions to address the lack of healthy uh, healthy foods and then the city uh, committed to setting aside some funding to help implement one or more of those solutions and i encourage you to go to our website maybe we can drop some links in the chat too to both the parent fact sheets as well as our case studies um, and in the case studies in particular, we tried to include a playbook of three to five steps that your city could take based on learning in another, in another city to implement similar actions. So probably like many of you, and I'm sure I could learn from you, um, you know, think about how to evaluate your project. And to help me in this, I gave a presentation about program evaluation at the American Public Health Association meeting last fall. And to prepare for that, I, I just did a convenient sample of the funders in my network to learn how they um, evaluated projects and um, also looked at our Bright Cities reports to try to draw upon these key impacts, key characteristics of projects that had an impact. Yeah, I don't think you'll be surprised to see any of these findings, but this learning does help us guide, you know, our next iteration of Bright Cities. So we try to help the actions be institutionalized and we have sample policies um, uh, around things like environmentally preferable purchasing um, that cities can use. Um, projects, of course, with a track record of success are often more successful. And, and I have experimented with different models in trying to fund cities where there's not a lot happening versus trying to fund somewhere there is a little momentum. I've struggled with working in those cities that don't have a lot of momentum to start with, um, but would be interested in your feedback on that. Clearly leadership matters, including being self-reflective um, about the process from both the leader, the staff, and the community side. Um, I liked uh, this this message uh, tr that there's always a transfer, there's a tra when there's a transformation that takes place that helps improve the workflow. Uh, for example, a city council member or your mayor all of a sudden gets that neuro reducing neurotoxic ex uh, exposures can help meet climate goals and becomes a champion of this. Or somebody is empowered in the community that can share more broadly with other residents um, to have an impact. So we try to look for those transformative opportunities. Um, and then my colleague, Jamie Alberts at the National League of City um, shared her equity lens with me just asking the simple questions about who's missing, who's burdened, and who's benefiting. And so that's something that we're trying to more intentionally include um, in our RFPs this year. Uh, where do we see disparities? Well, as you know, we see them all around. Um, and as I'm talking a little bit, you can you know, review this diagram from the fourth national climate assessment. Clearly, we're working with children, who are more sensitive, 
given that they eat more food and drink more water relative to their body mass as compared to adults and hopefully engage more frequently in hand to mouth behavior than other adults. Um, but we know that before and after exposures um, to neurotoxins uh, pose a significant risk uh, to individual individuals throughout their lifetime. And I think it's always really just amazing to reflect upon the fact that during the first few years of life, uh, neural connections form at the incredible rate of one billion connections per second. And whether um, these connections thrive or weaken, weaken um, forms what the Harvard University on the Developing Child calls the architecture of our brain, clearly with lifelong impacts. Um, and we know just for one example, as you can see in the picture, that air pollution is a well-documented um, risk factor for adverse neurodevelopment as well um, you know, as a host of, of other health outcomes. And then you might wonder, well, how many people are exposed to adverse um, air quality? And according to the, the latest American Lung Association State of the Air report, it's 40% of Americans live in areas um, where, with failing grades for air quality. That's 137 million people. And we know that BIPOC communities are one and a half more times uh, likely to experience poor air quality than white communities. And so clearly, we don't need reminding that these need addressed. Um, and I did have the opportunity to take a class with the management center, I think a couple weeks ago, and they really, and I did that in order to help us be more intentional about uh, equity centered work. So as I go into this new year um, of funding, when we do our RFPs for the first time, we'll be asking explicitly who's missing, who's burdened, and who's benefiting from this proposal. Um, as I mentioned before, for any city within our network, um, we are available to help with the grant writing for federal infrastructure dollars. And we also do our best to do peer networking and connect um, cities to share the resources, uh, the knowledge resources uh, all the way around. And so what's our ultimate goal? Well, if it wasn't clear, just in a nutshell, it's really to empower cities to integrate actions that reduce neurotoxic exposures into their climate sustainability or resilience plan. Okay, well, maybe you have some ideas how you'd like to join, but here's a couple here. First, I recommend just taking some of this information and sharing it with others, share it around the dinner table, share it in your neighborhood, and then take it to work and figure out how you can reduce neurotoxic exposures in your workplace and figure out if there's an opportunity maybe to partner with the city or connect the, the county health department with your city to you know to take on this in a new way obviously apply for the federal funding opportunities um, there's plenty of groups that have roadmaps as well as organizations like the local infrastructure hub that has a cohort model designed to help specifically cities apply for this funding and then just to keep in mind that we'll have Two Bright Cities RFPs in 2023. Um, we'll have one just to, for, to support cities trying to integrate neurotoxic exposure reductions into their existing planning. And another one where we're truly trying to follow the risk. We know people are indoors most of their time. So how can cities encourage um, those in the indoor environment to reduce sources of exposure? Uh, here's my contact information. Thank you for your time, and I encourage you to, to reach out to me with ideas uh, or other brainstorming. Thanks. All right, do we have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for presenting today. It's great information. You can go ahead and unmute yourself as well if you have a question. It's easier than writing it in the chat.
I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so a question, I don't know if it's exactly related, um, and thank you guys. Um, this is very exciting information. And I work for WIC, um, run our um, WIC program for Davidson County in Nashville, Tennessee. And so we do have a lot of families ask questions and we wanna be able to, and we wanna look on the, um, the website at the information that you had. So maybe we can start handing those out. But one question that comes up often is like, well, I'm gonna grow all my own food in my backyard. I mean, of course we know not all the food, but um, what are, like when you're making these community gardens, um, what, what is realistic information? I mean, in my thought, you know, I'm thinking, well, I don't know who lived in the house before me and what they put in the ground and in the yard. But um, if they go to, if we made raised beds, even at our WIC offices or anything, and you go buy um, soil and dirt and compost at Home Depot, is that checked for, you know, heavy metals? Like um, what, if we wanted to give them things that they can control and they can do and grow strawberries or something easy with their family. Like, how do we know that that is a good recommendation or not? That's such a good question. I, maybe a number of us have ideas. <laughs> probably all have ideas there. I actually don't know <clears throat> the practices of, you know, your local, you know, Home Depot or you know wherever you would you would buy soil. I don't know their practices for testing soil. Um, we, we produced a garden guide to help people build safer gardens at home. And we really advocate testing the soil that you're planning to use. And, you, you know, most states, you know, the, uh, extension offices will test soil samples for lead. What I found is that you really do have to contact the local extension office because every office has like a different procedure they want you to use but they do test for lead. And we provide in our one page garden guide um, uh, advice on the levels that are safe for like an adult or for a child that's helping you garden. And you know, lead is, is the biggest problem when it comes to urban gardens, but you know, there's ar there arsenic and, and other things like just not gardening in an area that had a, a wooden fence in the past that almost certainly was preserved with arsenic um, pesticides and, you know, would have leached arsenic into the soil, you know, staying away from known areas of contamination is a really good idea, but certainly testing the soil is, is a, a really good first step, at least for lead. And, and I would just add to the, the first level of advice about not near a wooden fence, an old wooden fence. And the other is not right next to the exterior wall of a house that was probably painted before lead became illegal in paint. So if the house is older than 1975, it, it probably has lead flakes um, in the soil and you don't wanna grow, you, you wanna grow flowers there that you're not eating or bushes, you don't wanna grow food. Um, and and I, would, I would start with those two things. And then most, while, the com while Jane is, is exactly right, the process is different everywhere, it's mostly free to get your soil tested. And so uh, um, either asking people to do that or, or maybe um, going to your local, uh, doing a little advocacy on behalf of families and asking a uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever you've got to actually have them test their three top selling uh, soils uh, to make sure that they're low in lead. They they may have done it, but I, but certainly it's not known, and it's something we have to make known. So so much of this problem that we're dealing with today is just because people weren't paying attention for the last fifty years, and um, and that's why we need to pay attention now. Thank you. Um, I'm just laughing because we have blackberries next to an old wooden fence and tomatoes next to the house that's probably painted in 1970. So I think I will take your advice myself. <laughs> mm. 
We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one, the first question is, do you recommend any commercial soil test kits? You know, that's a good question. I, I don't, I haven't looked into those, but um, you do want one that doesn't, that is more sensitive than, um, you know, 400 parts per million, for instance, is an EPA standard for super fun site soil for lead. So you really need to be way below that in the capability of the test to detect lower levels. So I, I would just, um, you know, you'd want to be down at, you know, 100 parts per million, 20 parts per million um, in the detection um, limit for the test. So that's really the big concern with commercial tests is sometimes they just can't test in the, the smaller amounts that are actually dangerous for children. So I, I haven't looked at that. So I, I don't know which ones would be, you know, which ones we would endorse. It's really important. I know that um, some of the tests that 3M, uh, I'll, I'll name names, um, has a stick that you could use to test for lead, like, you know, to see if there's lead paint on the wall or lead lead uh, glaze on a piece of, of pottery. Um, but, and it says red means lead. Well, not really, because the just like, as Jane was saying, the sensitivity is very low. So you can have a lot of lead in um, your paint, and it's not going to turn red because it's it's um, designed to work at a level of lead exposure that is just way too high. I, I there's a, a question in the chat about pregnancy, and and um, as Jane said the the we're 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 very proud that fda is doing something uh to get us closer to zero but it won't do anything for pregnant women if the only foods they focus on are commercial baby foods that that they they know better they know that um if there's lead in the sweet potatoes in a jar of baby food, most of the lead is coming from the sweet potatoes. And so their original intention, if you look at the founding documents of the FDA's Closer to Zero program, was not to just do commercial baby food, but to do the foods that babies might eat. And, um, and we were part of those discussions that made it quite clear that FDA understood that they needed to protect the food supply and the pregnant women who rely on that food supply. But that hasn't happened yet. And I, it won't happen unless we advocate strongly that it needs to happen. I, I just I also think just to add to that 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 um because as Jane said, we try very hard to um uh, walk the tightrope between concern and panic. Um there there are foods that you can grow in your garden and there are foods you can buy in the store that don't have a lot of heavy metals. Bananas, for example are really clean, even if you don't buy organic, you should buy organic bananas to protect banana growers and banana harvesters. But, but the banana and the inside is clean, whether it's organic or not. And, and other foods um, that if, if you look at our reports, while 95% of the foods we tested had some heavy metals, some foods had way less than others. So, so um, having a diet that's that's um, that encourages those foods rather than the high contaminant food just makes a lot of sense. I would just add too that our you know maybe our top piece of advice is just to eat a varied diet, and that sounds so basic, and we've heard it a thousand times, but. You know, when I started thinking about it, is is there something that I eat every day or that I fed my child every day? I might think, yeah, they have a varied diet. And I might forget that I actually give them, you know, a certain food kind of every day, even though they're eating lots of different things. And I think asking, you know, stepping back and saying, is there something that I'm eating all the time? And that, you know, that sort of is, is a key uh, moment when you could say, okay, well, let me add some variety because um, serving the same food every, every day to a child could 
accidentally concentrate a particular contaminant, you know, whether it's a heavy metal or a certain kind of pesticide or something like that. So variety is a great way to minimize risk. And we see like high, higher levels of lead and cadmium in things like sweet potatoes and carrots. So they're still great to eat, of course. So our advice to parents, because they're so nutritious, but our advice to parents has been just mix them up with other vegetables. Don't serve sweet potatoes and carrots every single meal and every single day. Serve a, serve a really wide variety. I did. Oh, I put a link in our chat for our safe garden guide that shows um, levels of lead um, that are safe for kids and adults. And, you know, if your child is helping you garden, for instance. And then I see a tip from George on, on checking with your county ag extension office on uh, how to test, how to get them to test your soil for lead. Right. And, and while we're talking about contaminated soil, we should probably add our tip that hand washing and taking your shoes off before you come in the house are both really good practices to keep uh, heavy metals out of your child's mouth, um, uh, uh, out of the food that you're preparing, um, and uh, off the floor. That that we, we want, if there's lead outside, the best way to keep it from getting inside is to take off your shoes at the door. Do we have any other comments, questions, any thoughts? You can take yourself off mute or write it in the chat. We recently had our soil tested for um, Sunday. Do you know the company? Um, Sunday Lawn. And um, they're supposed to be like a more healthy alternative to putting like fertilizer and stuff on your yard. But they do require, like they you send in a box, like you send in a soil sample. So I'm going to go back, but um, just maybe that's even like a a good collaborator if you guys are looking for organizations because um, they're already taking soil samples um, and they um, they already have like an idea when you send your soil in um, based on neighbors that may have already done it, but then they like add to it when you send it in. Interesting. Um, when, when Jane, I think that's a, a, a really good idea. When Jane was talking about formula, I... Um, wrote a note that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pick up now that it's so important to, to uh, know about the levels of lead in the water you mix formula with. And um, we were really um, excited that the city of Denver, one of the bright cities, uh, when they were changing out their lead service lines, they fully recognize that the change out period can actually add more lead to the water while the pipes are being shaken up and replaced. And so um, they gave residents Brita filters that do a good job of getting lead out of the water supply and, and did a lot of public education about the importance of using those filters, especially if you're mixing water um, uh, with powdered formula for your baby. And it, it's another important way to lower the levels of lead contamination. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you again folks for attending and thank you to our presenters for presenting. Um, just a couple of things, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar as well as a follow-up survey 
please, please, please answer it because it helps us understand what our members need with City Match as well as our presenters, kind of getting a good feel of where everyone's at on this work. Um, and then please look out for our next Learning Network webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.